Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Lisa All, and I'm in the Education Department at Pittsburgh Valley Theater. And this is an educational program for our open air series of performances, which begins this week and runs for two weeks at Shenley Park in Pittsburgh. And the performances are outside, and we are really so excited to be back on stage here in Pittsburgh. Um, just a couple housekeeping notes before we start and before I introduce everybody. So this is a Zoom webinar. So um, unfortunately, we cannot see the audience, but we would love for you to participate. So if you have a question or if you'd like to make a comment, um, please feel free to put it in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. So I don't think the chat is enabled for this um, program, but um, please do use the Q&A. We would love to hear from you and love to have your questions and we'll answer them at the end of the program or um, maybe we'll answer them in the middle of the program too. We'll just see how that goes. Um, but I just want to thank our panelists here and introduce everybody real quickly. So we are really fortunate to have two of our amazing Pittsburgh Valley Theater company members here with us today, Tommy Lynn Heston, who is a soloist at PBT, and Alexander Coaches, who is the principal dancer at Pittsburgh Valley Theater. Um, we also have Janet Groom Campbell, who is PBT's costumier, and Janet plays a crucial role in this ballet. And then, of course, we have Gina Patterson, choreographer of the ballet that we're talking about tonight, Trinity Bust. Sculptor Clay Muse. And Trinity Bus will be shown, will be performed at four of the upcoming eight performances over the two-week period of open air. So just a little bit about Gina before we get started. So Gina is a Pittsburgh native, which is really special. Um, we're so happy that she's back here and working with us. Um, Gina trained with some renowned ballet. Uh, teachers here in Pittsburgh, and then was also an apprentice at PBT, actually, under Patricia Wild, one of our former artistic directors. She danced with Ballet Austin and Ballet Florida and guested at a number of places around the world, and then has been choreographing for 20 years, I think, Tina, is that correct? <laughs> and oh, <yeah. laughs> I'm flying by, so I lost track. <laughs> and she is acclaimed for the beauty, the innovation, the creativity, and the humanity that she brings to her work. So welcome, everybody, and thank you guys so much for being here. Um, so let's get started, Gina, with just, like, how did this come about? How did this opportunity happen to create a ballet for PBT for the open air series? Yeah, I, I got a, a call one evening from Susan and she asked me, Susan Jaffe, the artistic director, and she invited me to do a solo for the open air series. And at first, of course I said, I'd love to. And, um, but then I was like, oh my goodness, a solo, that's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, oh man. Uh, but I have been working on a project for the last, I've been writing about it maybe three years, perhaps more, and received a fellowship from the Bogliosco Foundation, um, a fellowship I'm going to be actually in residence for this fall. Um, and I thought, oh, it would be, you know, I proposed perhaps using the, that opp this opportunity to start investigating and asking the question, who is Camille Claudel? Because my project is, uh, the overall arching project is Camille Unseen, and it, it deals, uh, it's inspired by the life of Camille Claudel, but then also taking, you know, asking the question, what is unseen and, in, and who is invisible and what are the factors that go into being supported and not supported. And um, her life, I just wanted to use her life as a, as a blueprint uh, for this work. Uh, 
of the overall work and this work that I think is a piece in and of itself. So anyway, I just thought I'd a start asking who is Camille Claudel and it quickly turned into, and who are those that step into this role? And, and who are the, these wonderful women, you know, Alexa and Tommy and the, um, the others that, you know, will do it, um, you know, who are they and, and who am I and who are all women and, and like what, and, and, people in general, like what are the, these universal themes that we're working with in terms of people living in the shadows? So I'll tell you a little bit when we do some slides about Camille's life, but yeah, so I just proposed that use, using this as an opportunity to, to start this little kernel into the larger work. And uh, I've been really excited about working with everybody on this. So I can't wait for everybody to hear from the others as well. So it's been a great collaboration. Well, let's take a look at some of your inspiration for, um, for the ballet. I'm going to just share my screen here and we'll take a look at some slides of some sculptures by Camille Claudel. And if you don't mind, Gina, just giving us a little bit of background on, on who she is and um, uh, just a little bit of her story. Yeah, yeah. Camille Claudel, um, I was maybe 25 years ago in Paris, like looking, uh, looking at Rodin, August Rodin's work. And I love his work and I didn't know about Camille. And when I started to learn about her through through looking at his work, I learned that she was a genius in her own right and a sculptor, but she was also more known as the apprentice of, the mistress of, the, um, you know, the muse of August Rodin. And so in starting this piece, I, I was just curious, like, Camille, who are you outside of the shadows of, of others? And she was born, you know, doing her work in the late 1800s when um, women were not accepted into the arts institutions. And, you know, she had to sort of fight against um, society and, and uh, in terms of being recognized. And she really wasn't recognized until after her death. Um, something that really struck me about her life was just she had she was in an insane asylum <laughs> the last 30 years of her life and um, committed by her brother, specifically in her family. And um, so she never, once she was in the insane asylum, she had never uh, done her work again. She stopped creating. And um, for me, I just wonder, you know, if it was in, in this day and age, would she have been committed to an insane asylum? Like what would have happened to her life if she was supported uh, for the genus that she was and had the same opportunities as the other, her fellow artists um, of the time. So uh, her, her story is very sad <laughs> to me, but it also really inspires me because I love her her work. I feel like it's so emotional and just, uh, it really moves me. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, let's take a look at a few, uh, a few yeah. sculptures. Yeah. yeah, so this, again, this is just really, this, uh, what I wanted for this solo uh, was just capturing moments of her work and, and um, just referencing it. And while the solo that you'll see for the open air series is not a narrative about Camille Claudel. Uh, it's more inspired by Camille Claudel. And so you, it'll, it'll be like a little find Waldo moment where you'll see some of her, some of her, the references to her work in the piece. Um, and I, um, yeah, th these are just, I, I love just the purity and innocence of the, of the, of the little, uh, Chatelaine, I'm sure I didn't pronounce that very well, but um, there's, we talked a lot in the work, uh, the solo about the innocence of, of a young, um, of a young girl that she had a relationship with in terms of, uh, she was just really inspired by her at, at a certain point in her life and she didn't have children of her own. And, um, 
I was really, some of the inspirations for the work is just, you know, who, who was Camille in terms of like the, the woman herself, like the sen her, her sensuality, you know, the innocence, the, the uh, raw talent and um, genius, uh, I was gonna say choreographer, no, <laughs> she was a genius <laughs> sculptor, <laughs> but, th but this uh, moment here is in the choreography. <laughs> And you'll um, and there's so many uh, meanings that we can talk about later. This inspiration was actually uh, taken in a, the sculpture garden outside the center of the arts in Puerto Rico, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I worked there for many years, and I always wanted to do a piece that was inspired by these sculptures. They just really stayed with me for so long. And then when Janet and I started talking about costuming. It just felt like this could be a piece that that this can come could come forward in, and it kind of rolled from there. Um, and I'll let Janet talk a little bit about that. <laughs> yes, it sort of did roll from there, but it was very um, very interesting and a real nice challenge. And I thought it was such a unique piece that I was really um, excited about building the costumes for it. Was this an, an image that Gina shared with you, Janet? Yes, at, so. yes. and it was very, um, you know, interesting to me. And then one day at Joanne's, I found the perfect fabric, so <laughs> and <she> liked it. <laughs> so then we went on from there. It was it was good. It was really good. Yeah, I loved it, Janet. And then this next slide, uh, Janet had. Um, we were talking about the waltz, and my original thought was that I would reference this in the actual choreography but then once Janet and I started speaking about it and then showed her the, that other those other sculptures and she found the fabric um, you, I'm so excited for you to see what she created because it really ended up referencing the waltz right Janet I know you were really inspired by that yes I was trying to duplicate some of the lines in the waltz in her skirt you know in the flowiness of it oh. and was fun. Okay, so this is um, part of your notebook, Gina, for your your ideas and recording. Kind of um, just let us tell us how how do you um, how do you record your ideas? How do you remember your ideas? What's your process for like creating, starting a work like this? Yeah, I actually, uh, I mean, I go through a really long and in-depth research process, um, you know, for most work. And this one I just started in January, um, but I was thinking about it, you know, from the moment Susan had uh, contacted me. But this, I, this were, was actually some of the beginning writings. Well, also I was making a little compilation of notes <laughs> to, to talk to Janet because I wanted to share all my numerous thoughts with her. <laughs> I was like, are you tired yet? <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I was using this to try to communicate with Janet and Curtis, who is the, the prop designer. And um, so that we could bounce ideas off of it. And then like these are just, this is how I notate music is, you know, my own sort of notation. I, I'll count out the music and then I kind of have visuals for the how I hear certain music. And this actually came after the fact when I was sort of notated where I wanted things. Uh, but that also has evolved since the dancers got involved. So I'm sure they have things to say about that. <laughs> When, yeah, yeah, and just some more notations. I um, this helps me visualize the music, you know. So even I, I really like to build uh, physical phrases with the dancers when I start with them. That I'm building it, the 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 rhythm that I want, or that a rhythm to create an emotion, and then um, even if I'm not using the music, and then I'll have the dancers then after the fact after learning phrases of physicality, then putting it over the music so it sort of then becomes eventually a marriage of where it falls into place. And then for me, I'm notating music like this, so I always have the music in my head and I kind of know how 
it might fit. And I really think for me, it's very valuable to keep an open mind and a flow with it in terms of even though I think it should go a certain place or, or even the physicality should be how it, it should be. Um, I really like to do all the research up front, do the music work and then let it go going into the studio to, to allow an opportunity for discovering magic and the gems, you know, that aren't planned and that are discovered along the way. And these were, yeah, this was some early sketches again to communicate with Janet <laughs> and uh, Curtis. And this is, um, these were actually after having initial conversations with them both and things that Janet had said and Curtis Dunn had said actually inspired me to like, okay, how can we pull this all together? And then the thing I love about collaborating and then collaborating with Janet and Curtis this time and the dancers, I mean, they're very much a part of it. I think in any great co collaboration, you know, here's, okay, here's my concepts. They add their ideas. I can bounce off of their ideas and then it, it can get to a higher place or, or this more in-depth place and integrated place than it could have been just from my own mind. So I think that, um, and all of the, all of this for me is just a way and a means to communicate, you know, uh, as part of the pr creative process. I think it's really important to go through that. And then at the bottom on that second page, I, we have Curtis had, I was just going to have a plain old box, <laughs> as you can see in the drawing. And Curtis gave uh, some really great ideas to implement the male and female presence into the work. And so you'll see uh, in some, uh, some of the next slides, I was trying to see what the light, what it would look like in lighting, you know, uh, depending on which side the box was flipped on. And these these are some notes. These, this is just a little snippet of a storyboard for lighting. I like to storyboard out the piece and some, you know, so that I could communicate again with a lighting designer. Um, and that always becomes part of the process. And it's usually very valuable in the lighting process to, you know, help know, know at what point the lights will shift and what needs to happen so you can have that conversation ahead of time. Yeah, and this is some of Curtis's early proposals to me when we were talking about how these set pieces, could, well, props really, because they're interacting with it, how they could look and what materials and how it could be as light as it could be. Although <laughs> we've had, it, it became like a little um, a workout for the ladies. They have been troopers and yeah, it's just, you know, things always come up in the process and the ideal, the, in an ideal world, you know, we, we think these things will happen just perfectly and then then real life happens, right? <laughs> and I think you mentioned it, Gina, but I just want to say again, Curtis Dunn is our production manager and um, you worked very, very closely with him, obviously, on this project too. And he is at Open Air tonight setting up the stage. And actually there's a, a performance of another organization there tonight. So he's there doing that and wishes he could be with us, but. Yeah, and these are in process, in process uh, box making. <laughs> yeah, Curtis did a wonderful job and, and like really took all the concepts that Janet, you know, Janet and I were talking about and even feedback then once the dancers got involved and really tried to, you know, keep perfecting along the way. It's sort of, in some ways, a work in progress, like in, in all areas, but also just very much its own, its own work. And so I'm excited for everybody to see it, um, the piece, to see how this is integrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is be Janet's beautiful work. <laughs> I don't know, Janet, if you want to say something about that. Well, the photo on the um, right was the one that I did as a sample of what we could do for her dress. And then on the left is the actual dress as we we're making it lying on the cutting table. And um, I think one of our, one of your concepts was that um, she was in the statue and then she mm -hmm. came out and she was just a soft, vulnerable, beautiful woman. And that's why we were using softer fabrics. Now, the first dress we made, um, I made it very full at the bottom and it was a little too much. So we took a lot of the fullness out and then um, it was more 
pleasing to the choreography and it looked better for the piece. But that's mm -hmm. something that happens sometimes, you know, sometimes on a mannequin, you get carried away. <laughs> when the dancer tries to, to wear it, it just isn't right. So you just fix it. And this is the bodice that we um, built for it. Now, the tricky thing about the bodice was that the dancer takes it off and she places it on a pedestal and it had to stand up by itself. So we boned it like we normally would a bodice, but we also boned the bottom edge and the top edge so that when they took it off, we hooped it really with, with tutu hooping. When they took it off, they could just put it, hook it together and it would stand nicely on the pedestal. So we're real happy that that worked so easily. <laughs> I know. It was really, I'm good. I have one comment and then I'm going to let the <laughs> and let the Tommy comment on it because yeah. um, part of this concept of the, the bodice what, and the, the skirt here, yeah, the skirt was this idea of the shells, like Janet was referencing, the shells that we hide behind, the shells of um, society, uh, you know, what, who, who are we, you know, as in terms of how society defines it or, you know, our community, our family, our, our religion and on and on and on. And then, you know, kind of this idea of being trapped in those shells and, and getting out of that. And then the skirt here, it was a really wonderful discovery, like thinking of discoveries. Um, uh, two things, uh, Jan when Janet uh, came up with this, uh, design it real and then mixed with uh, Eric Midgley actually uh, who's also my husband had created some sound design uh, because I wanted to create an environment before the actual piano piece that happened that kind of that spoke and helped illustrate some of the concepts of her life to kind of give it give it an environment and flavor of Camille's life and being uh, trapped in the walls and uh, the religious aspect. But then once once that music and I saw heard the music and saw the dress together, there was one day we just went, oh, I just went, oh, hey, could you hide behind there and like start squeezing the skirt and I didn't even know what we were really doing and then I realized it, it, um, it really reflects the name this idea of being the sculptor the clay and the muse all at once and simultaneously and sort of one moment to the next and this idea of sculpting who you are like quite literally <laughs> sculpting you know creating a sculpture from a block of clay and you know going deeper and deeper into it and paralleling this idea of, you know, we're continue shaping or reshaping who we are. And I don't know if Alexa and Tommy want to speak a little bit about any of that. There was a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I, it has okay. been a really um, interesting process th throughout its whole arc. Um, and I was really um, glad that I was able to be a part of like the beginnings of it and really see how it, it's, you know, transformed and morphed and um, everything and how everyone that was working on the piece really like put something into the final product. Um, and I do have to say that anytime a dancer has to work with a prop on stage in a confined amount of time, it adds a little bit of nerve wrackingness to the choreography. But I do really think that um, the use of the costume like adds so much to um, just the like the visceral feelings that someone will get watching the piece. Yeah, yeah sorry Alexa and Tommy <laughs> for that extra stress. <laughs> I Talk think it really that. adds to it. I love that we have to, obviously it's stressful, but I do love that we have to um, really work with the project like she works on her art. And um, I really love the piece that your husband created that has those very like haunting church bells. And it just like reminds me that like our past always haunts us. And it's about like breaking free of that. And then as soon as we break free of the dress, it's like, oh my gosh, I still have this corset on and we have to break. It's like, we're constantly stripping away until we're just like this vulnerable wash of, you know, woman of human. And it's, I think it's very relatable to the audience and it's been such a joy to be a part of and I'm very grateful for the opportunity and to 
see it from the very, very beginning stages where you're kind of like, I wonder what this is going to turn into until yesterday when we were doing a dress rehearsal and it's like, it's all come together. Mm. And it's true, the soundscape for me, I mean, we were talking in the studio today about how every time we're doing it, it's going to be different and just like embracing that fact. But every time we get behind the dress and that soundscape happens, it really um, just centers me and like puts me in the right headspace. So yeah, I, I really loved the addition of that to the piece. That first bell that tolls, like that starts the whole piece. I get chills every time I'm behind the skirt. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's just, it's just so like haunting and yeah. It makes like, take uh, a deep breath. Right, <laughs> right. Janet, talk a little bit about any challenges that you had with this skirt. So just to be clear, so a dancer is, the skirt is not something the dancer wears. It's a no. prop that the dancer stands behind. Yes, She's wearing the corset, but go yes. ahead and explain. The skirt is on a, a metal frame and uh, props, Curtis made it and the prop man made it. And it's uh, like a half circle and then it, it, you know, we hang the skirt and the hoop underneath the skirt onto it. And one of the funniest days I think was when I took, that's the rehearsal skirt you're looking at. The, the real skirt is a little bit different, tucked differently. But the first day it was going into a Zoom rehearsal with Gina, I took the skirt into the studio and Steven, our ballet master was like, we don't need that now. We, we're, we're just starting this piece it's too early and I said no I said Gina wants to see this <laughs> and we didn't even have the form for it yet so I had this pedestal in the costume shop that I dragged into the studio <laughs> and hooked it around the pedestal so that they could at least stand behind it and, and work with Gina and um, it was interesting because usually we do things in a gradual basis where they learn the basic choreography and then they get into props and things but this one we started right with it which I thought was good because they knew from the very beginning that um, this was a, a very big piece of of the choreography um, it was that one there I put I used the um, the lycra and it had a, a silver metallic um, overlay on it and what I did was where you see the clumps, I put felt behind the fabric so that it would, um, it would clump properly <laughs> and, you know, have some depth to it. And then uh, when I did the real one, I actually put like a ski cloth underneath the whole thing so that it's all interlined with that. And um, then what we did was we had a hoop skirt underneath it so that it would flare out so slightly. And we made like half a petticoat and we boned it. And then at the bottom with a hooping, we hooped it. Then at the bottom, we put a, um, like a, a, a quarter of a moon shape so that it would hold it around at the bottom and not just flare out. So um, mm -hmm. it was fun. And, and that rehearsal skirt that you see, I made in one evening because we decided what we wanted to start with, huh, Gina? And the <laughs> next day was the first Zoom rehearsal, but it was all wonderful. And like I said, we were very pleased with how everything came out and the softness and the, the um, flowiness of the dress underneath. That was, um, I think that worked very nicely as well, but it was very neat to be part of. And, and when you do have a project that you're starting from the ground up, like we did on this, you really get intrigued by it. and it's always sort of a part of you in some way because you did you did create it, you know, from the get-go, all, all of us, you know, and it, it is nice to collaborate with everyone and share thoughts with everyone about what we think will work the best. So it was wonderful working with Gina and uh, Tommy and Alexa. I'd call them in and say, you have to stand by this. I have to <laughs> see how it's going to work. And they, you know, very graciously came in right away and yeah, we figured the things out. So, yeah, Alexa and Tommy have been so um, just just so uh, invested. In, I mean, everybody has been so invested. And I was just thinking to, in today's rehearsal, I just 
felt so moved to watch you ladies um, last night and then in today's rehearsal, just to think where we started, like Janet was saying on Zoom, you know, I was in Wyoming, you're there, we have a skirt. And my original thought is I wanted you to stand in the skirt and then you come out. Ooh, okay. So that's not very interesting. So, you know, again, like when this idea of like building the clay, you know, starting the piece as if you're starting a sculpture, it really reflects the piece, you know, and I just, uh, I feel like you've, you two have just really become these most amazing sculptures, <laughs> real life sculptures. And just, I'm, just, you've just really integrated all the details we talked about, all the little concepts and fine tuning and, the, and Alexa and Tommy really took it to, you know, who are they? And, and what I loved about their work is they were willing to just embrace it and put themselves into it and start shaping who they are in the work and it, like it, it's no longer about Camille it's about Alexa it's about Tommy and I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that Alexa or Tommy <laughs> how that journey was for you like when did you discover it <laughs> um it definitely I mean for me the process always kind of starts with um steps and then gradually you're allowed to let some of that go and like filter down to more emotional stuff and that's the part of the you know process and the work that I love the most is once you're able to you know let all those specifics and details and music and steps and technique kind of go and um, really just yeah find out who you are and what you can do within this framework. Yeah I definitely agree this was probably the single most individual piece I've ever done. Obviously it's a solo, but I feel I can be me and I can find, you know, little bits of who I am in each part of the solo. And, you know, the inspiration just like poured out of you, Gina. So it was really easy to play off of a lot of the, the feedback you were giving us. But yeah, I, th I swear every time I do it, I find little pockets of music that I like better or just a different way to do the steps, I guess. But mm -hmm. it's really incredible. It's like a journey every single time we start the, the piece. Mm -hmm. I remember after the first Zoom rehearsal, Gina read us something that she had written, which was kind of like her thoughts and um, almost like in a way, like her speaking to Camille, but just through her thoughts. And it, it was this long, beautifully composed thing. And she read it for like 10 minutes and then she's like, so who has any thoughts, Alexa? And I was like, I feel like I have to digest that for like two weeks before I do it justice by commenting on it. She really was just like a wealth of information and inspiration. Right. I remember leaving that exact rehearsal and just like being like, oh, I need to really digest all of that. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> I just think. Sorry. Gina, I was just going to say, we haven't mentioned the music. So what is the music? Um, oh, it talk is, about that for a minute. Uh, it's Teresa Carreño. And it's a piano piece, a solo piano piece. Oh, and that actually is a big topic of conversation now that I'm thinking about it. Because when we first started the Zoom, back to the original Zoom rehearsal, I was working with two different pieces of music. And one was a Philip Glass and really orchestrated. And then one was solo piano by, I, I did want a female. Um, and I wanted, to, uh, I chose the piece of music because I felt like it just captured the, the essence of, of her story. And then it also was so, a solo. And then also as a female composer, but I just love this Philip. I love Philip Glass, this piece that I wanted. And I thought, oh, it's so emotional. But the interesting thing is once we, we kind of, I built some movement and then we did it over this piece and over this piece. And I know Alexa and Tommy had, had uh, I think in watching each other, you could see the differences, right? And surprisingly to me, the piano kind of gave, gave more space for, to, to illuminate the dancers and to illuminate the story. And so that's why I ended up going with that piece of music. Mm -hmm. so I, 
So at the dress rehearsal last night, I heard you all talking at the rehearsal today that people were saying that they saw both of you do the, the ballet and people were saying that it looked like two different ballets. So what do you think accounts for that? And, and like, just what is that? How does that happen? Um, I think it, it has a lot to do with um, Gina and her idea um, that this isn't Camille's story, but it's Camille's story through our lens. So um, then inherently, I guess it would have to be a little bit different. But yeah, I, I, I really love that about the piece that um, she gave us that space to make it our own. Yeah, me too. I love that, you know, we're different dancers, we're different people. So the story is going to be different in our bodies. Um, and I think that Gina giving us the freedom to really play with the piece and, you know, not be afraid to try different things out, even if we, you know, even if it just doesn't work out for us. But I really loved that we had the freedom. It wasn't so like, this is on five, this is on six, this is on seven, this is on eight. It was like, you know, if, if you hang on to this a little longer, just borrow from that. And I just really love that process. Yeah, it's been really wonderful to see both these ladies just find their way in the process, you know, because it's not always like that um, in terms of, like you said, so, and even just sometimes in one single work, sometimes you do have to count it out and be, with, especially if you're dancing with other people. But that's what I also loved about the solo is that it could give you this room. And then, you know, in terms of the collaboration, I think it helped when I could see Tommy, you know, I had uh, two other ladies as well in the room. And I think even just in watching each other, oh, this person's doing this and oh, this person's doing this. So it's really, the work is also a compilation of everybody, you know, each dancer and then how they'll shape and, and, and put that little bit of information to weave it together like a really finely woven tapestry. Um, Alexa and Tommy, Talk a little bit about doing a solo. So I know you've done obviously solos in the past, but what is that? Is there, what's the difference between doing a solo and doing an ensemble ballet? And is the pressure different or how do you, how do you feel when you're on stage? Um, just um, having had a long career with many stages and, um, when I was younger and in the court of ballet, doing a solo was super intimidating. Like I, I really liked the um, structure and the collaborativeness of an ensemble piece. Um, and then as you know, I went through the ranks and had more experience and um, I came to love the, the freedom, like we've been speaking of, of just being able to let yourself go a little bit and you know, maybe not be exactly on the counts that, um, you originally had but you know the the live aspect of um performance kind of you know gives it a new shape um and now like, going back to doing ensemble work is actually kind of stressful for me because like everyone's gonna know if you messed up you know <laughs> but um I do still love like that um communal spirit that you get from performing with other people um, you can't really repl replicate that in any way. So, I mean, they both have their pros and cons. And one reason we're doing a solo is because of the pandemic and because of the way that we've been dancing and rehearsing for a year. Um, and actually we do have a question about that. Um, and the question is having to do the joint creative work during a pandemic and with Zoom must have been very difficult. So please describe that process. How was that for each of you? Well, I was going to say that the commute is really great. Like, <laughs> there's, there's, that's probably probably the only thing great about it is the commute. But um, I think I think there were still some wonderful things about working on Zoom. It, it is uh, for me. It was hard in the sense of. I had to always line up my camera to make sure I'm seen. And do you flip it? Do you not flip it? Do you have, you know, and it, it's hard. Like for me, I really uh, 
tap into like the energy of the people that are right there in front of you. And then also just in watching them move, really uh, feeling like where something needs to go next. So it was a little harder for me to ta tap into that. And it was even hard to know who was who because you just saw the eyes. And, and I had to, usually I'm really quick with names, but I kept having to say, who are you? <laughs> like, she, who, where's Alexa? <laughs> so it just it doesn't feel as personal as, as it, and intimate as it, as it um, normally can be. Because you hadn't even met them before. Right. But you met them on Zoom. And so, yeah. yeah, if having met them, like having worked with them and then doing Zoom rehearsals after was much easier, but to just try to get to know people and, and not even be able to, to feel that energy was very challenging for me. Janet, how about you working with, um, you know, designing something via Zoom with the choreographer? Um, I, I was really happy that our cameras on our phones are so good because I could send her pictures and then 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 would talk would talk on the phone and um, discuss what what pictures we sent and you know how how things worked and then I did send her a sample of the fabric so that she could actually feel the fabric that we were yeah. using yes and that was that was good because you always need to be able to do that you know it's very important to be able to to feel the fabric but um it was it was a little bit difficult but we managed you know and uh I think it's tell, a wonderful piece tell me how did you feel um or how was how was the process for you um it was definitely very different. I love feeding off of people's energy. So to not have Gina in the room was a little bit difficult at first, but also to touch on like having a mask on all day in the studios and doing such an emotional piece. Once we like stripped it away for like the very first time yesterday, I was like, oh my gosh, there's, there's so much more to this piece. And you really have to think about the emotion behind it, which usually would come so naturally, but without rehearsing, you know, rehearsing with a mask on makes it so much more difficult. And I think even once we took off our masks, Gina could see more of the piece through us because so much happens from here to here, I guess, in ballet to tell the story. Yeah, and that's, that's really interesting for an audience member to, um, you know, just kind of understand that. Obviously, we look for the expressions on dancers' faces, but we're also just looking at the movement all the time, too. And so it's interesting to hear that you all feed off of that um, expressed, expressed emotion as well. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, Gina, a question for you. What is coming next for you. So I guess you have the larger project and what else is on your plate coming up? Oh, yes, I'm going to um, to San Francisco to work with Smuin Ballet and, and setting a work there. And then I do have the Bogliasco Fellowship in the fall in Italy. And um, that will be about five weeks. And then I'm, uh, Susan originally had asked me to uh, create a Seven Deadly Sins for the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. And like the residency and everything else, it got canceled like after working 18 months on designs and with all students and, and everything got canceled four days before getting on the plane. That was the start of everything. So anyway, but uh, it is, they did call me or try to get it back on the books for um, it, that'll happen in the spring of 2022. So I'm really excited about finally doing that. And uh, yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, that's the, the nearest future. <laughs> so um, we have another question and let's see, is the ballet a tragedy? <laughs> um, I, I Okay, sorry, I, I, I'm stumbling on how to answer that. I, this particular solo, um, that was really, I think, 
uh, the ladies probably have something to say too, but for me, that was the hardest thing. And that's why I started the writing about it because I watched a couple movies as part of the research and I was going, what am I thinking? You know, I've always wanted to tell, for 25 years, I've wanted to tell her story or at least, you know, do something that helped illuminate her story uh, to help others. And um, I just, all of a sudden thought, it's so dark, how do I find the light in this? And that's really, I think that was a really invaluable question in terms of it helped me break through the struggle uh, of it you know, just that search for light. And that really helped define the piece. And for me, it's about, you know, just this idea. It, it ultimately came to be for me that is about this idea is like, can we break through? Can we rise above? And, and can we stand for who we are in all our beauty and flaws and, and just say, this is who I am. And so in, in a way, um, I, I think, you know, in, in the larger work, it will address some other things. But I think for this work, uh, I don't see it as a tragedy. You know, I, I see it as um, something as a transcendence. You know, I think, you know, I've watched these ladies transform in the work. And I hope that I, you know, I'll have to leave after opening night. But my hope is, you know, that you then take it take it for as long as you do it and then keep transcending it you know and I keep 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 finding your moments of transcendence and um so that's what it is for me Tommy or Alexa <laughs> how is it for you that's exactly what I was gonna say that I feel it's a transformation and of a piece rather than a tragedy yeah, you work through the tragic and the frustration, but it definitely ends on, um, I don't know, she is standing and surveying and being seen. Mm -hmm. So definitely on a positive note. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does look like at the beginning of the ballet that you're almost coming out of a cocoon or something like that, that you're emerging from that dress and unfolding in a way and it's, um, and the journey starts at that point. Um, what is the, another question, what is the movement quality or what is your movement um, kind of philosophy, Gina, in this ballet? Yeah, that's an interesting question because when you were talking about the mass, ladies, like and like expressing from here down, I, Early on, uh, I think it was a result of maybe not working with the best dancers. I, I worked with this group and, and uh, which is fine. I mean, for me, I've had, I think there's always a positive, there, there's something to learn in every situation. And, and for me, it was like one of the one of the really important things that I had learned. Um, I, they weren't good actors, you know, like they couldn't express I mean, I was a ballerina myself. And so for me, that just was what I did. And, uh, but to work with people who couldn't express in that way, I very quickly, like, how do I get, I, I mean, the piece is going on. How do I create a piece that expresses what I want to express? And that sort of has become my movement quality is then how do you physicalize? Like, how do you make physical the emotion of the piece? And I feel like, you know, a lot of, you know, so so that you don't have to rely on the expression of it. I mean, then I think for dancers like Alexa and Tommy who are able to do that, then it's just that much more powerful. But then regardless, even if they couldn't, you know, I work to try to sculpt the emotion into the physicality of it. I also sculpt it into the rhythm of it um, and, uh, and such. There's some other things, but uh, I would say, uh, it's something really human, you know, for me, you know, so many times I was like, okay, not arabesque, just stick your leg up or, you know, don't think of it like an attitude turn, think of it like, as like, ah, <laughs> so um, once we started talking like that, the piece got better. <laughs> and what is your idea for, what do you want the audience to, to get out of the ballet and how do you want to connect to the audience? 
Oh, I think the audience, I would really love for them to just get what they get out of it. I don't think you don't have to understand anything about Camille. You don't have to understand the story. You know, I put a little program notes to just kind of set a space uh, for to enter. But I just want you to go on a journey with the dancers and let them take you, you know, wherever they take you. And I think it's okay really to, you know, get your own, you know, be a collaborator as well. And, and you know, I, it'd be really interesting to hear your interpretation or just what, I think just allow yourself to be, to feel something with it and uh, just see, be open to whatever comes in. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks to our panelists. We really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, to talk about this new ballet. It's just been such an honor, Gina, to have you at PBT and creating a ballet on us, um, especially now. It's just really, really grateful to you for that. And um, thank you, Janet, Tommy, and Alexa for being here tonight to talk about this um, beautiful new creation. And thanks to all of our audience for being here. And we hope that we see all of you at open air. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity.